Hello, everybody. Hello, YouTube. Hello, art history enthusiasts and visual culture aficionados. It's me again, Miss M, and I'm back with another video. <laughs> Guess what it's about? Oh, my God. You know, if there is such a thing as patterns, right? I, I took I took an IQ test online once, and <laughs> I, I, I mean, allegedly this is the real one. I don't know, but um, I just did it out of curiosity, and it became very. I mean, I did okay, by the way. I, I got got a pretty darn good score, but then again, this this website was probably trying to sell me something, so of course they want you to feel smart, but. Never mind all that. Um, if these questions and what have you that I was that I was seeing on this IQ test um, online, if if it's any indication of the actual one, or or if they are like lifted from the actual one, uh, it became pretty apparent to me pretty darn quickly that the IQ test is just a pattern recognition test. You know, it doesn't matter whether those patterns are numerical or shapes or whatever. They want, you know, I guess having a high IQ means that you can um, spot patterns pretty quickly and, and be able to predict how they're going to, you know, continue. But, it, you know, if, if if my last, what, 12? Is this 12? No, six, no, 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 yeah, 12. 12 videos are any indication of a pattern. Yeah, tonight's video is going to be about you, that movie again. Okay, The Shining. The Shining. And I'm just having fun. Y'all, and I was just talking with um, Gershom and and Dr. Luke on Slack tonight, and oh boy, do I want to get into FMJ and Eyes Wide Shut. I wish I had more. For some reason, I'm stuck on this. For some reason, I'm stuck on The Shining. I don't know if I've got like some issue mentally. I know I probably have dyslexia, but maybe it's like even worse. Maybe there's more. Maybe I have ass burgers. Wouldn't that be something? Um, I don't know, but like I, I, I tend to fixate on things, so yeah, no, <sighs> I'm not happy about it, but that's who I am. Um, but such a fun conversation on Slack and exchanging ideas and sharing links and images and music and what have you. And like I said, you know, I've, I've been, I've been going shining crazy lately. I wish I had more free time and more free energy um, because <sighs> if I did, I would be doing like a video every day if I had that kind of time, if I had that kind of energy. Um, there's been like some stuff going on in my life lately. Nothing terrible, but like a lot of anxiety, like a lot of anxiety in my nerves are bad um you know i it's just been a lot so like if if you pray please just like throw one up there for me um i don't care what you believe in i don't care what religion you are i mean if you believe that like you know uh, uh, that that the, the a teacup is is the ruler of the universe then pray to that i, I really don't care but I need, like, I need good energy, I need good vibes. I hope this thing that I'm working on and hoping for in my professional life, um, I really want it to go my way because it would be a game changer, it would be a life changer. I've been, I've been hoping for this for a couple of years, let's, and, and, and I've, I've taken the first step the other day. I need all the help I can get. So maybe that's one of the reasons I've been so um, just frazzled. Um, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what to do. I don't know. Like I can't really relax. I'm I'm trying to keep it together because you got to do all the shit that you got to do with your day every day. But it's not easy, right? It's not easy. Still working out. The yellow dragon fruit worked. And just in case you're wondering, oh yeah. Oh yeah, it goes right through you. Let me just put it that way. Um, <laughs> anyway, that's a little too too much TMI, right? Um, but what what are we gonna be talking about today, people? You know, what are we gonna be talking about today? Um, well, 
what I'm going to be talking about, it's going to be about The Shining, of course, but it's, um, this, this, was this the last video? No, it's not the last video. Where does the blood come from? Where is that one? Uh, yeah, this, this is the 12 days ago. Okay. So where does the blood come from? And you all in the comments, you guys were just wonderful in the comments. I love these comments. I don't reply to them very much because again, I don't have that kind of time and that kind of patience or energy or strength lately, but I sure do read them all. And I, I try to give them all a like and, and, a, and a heart and a whole thing. Um, but I really do enjoy them. But the title of this video what was and is uh, Film Analysis, Where Does the Blood Come From? Okay. And today, <laughs> I don't know. I don't even know if I'm serious about this video. I don't even know if I'm like really serious about uh, what I'm about to um, lay on you in this video. I'm just having fun, but that doesn't mean we're not getting some work done. Work can be fun. And I, contrary to popular belief, work can be fun. Um, they use it as a punishment in, you know, prisons and whatever, get, putting putting those those people who are incarcerated to work. So they give work a bad name when they um, when they do that. But you know, work is noble. Work work can be wonderful. Um, but yeah. So where does the blood come from? Tadi, tadi. What I want to talk about is another substance that uh, there's an abundance of in this in this film in the shining by uh, by our wonderful uh stanley and i want to find out like where does the snow come from okay <laughs> where does the blood come from okay like i i already told you what i think about that and you know go ahead and watch this video to find out if you haven't already uh, but today i want to find out where the snow comes from and before I get into it, let me just go back to my home page. Um, I really enjoyed making this one with the missing scenes pictures. It's so much fun. I've been putting up music. What's the track today? Charlotte sometimes, yeah. And this one, The Full Metal Jacket Diary by Matthew Modine. I hope you guys enjoy that. It's for free on Archive. So check it out. Skinny Puppy is similar. Yes, I like Skinny Puppy, okay? Um... So I've been putting up all kinds of what I think is good stuff. Uh, again, I I think I've put up Sepultura a couple times, but I love them. Uh, Mr. Bungle. Love them. Love them so much. Um, but, you know, today, like I said, I want to find out where that snow comes from. I think I already, lo I, 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 I've located the source of the blood, uh, that, especially the, the one from the ele elevator. But today it's about the snow, because that one... You know, I'm not native to parts of the country where it snows um, regularly. I'm not from the Midwest. I'm not from the Pacific Northwest. I'm not from New England. I'm not from, you know, um, Illinois. I'm not from, you know, you all. I'm not from Alaska. I know, you know, Exorcist Reviews, I think you're from Alaska. And Tankard, you're in, if I'm not mistaken, uh, Illinois and... Uh, I think, Gersham, you're in, in New York. I'm in Los Angeles. Okay. <laughs> it snowed a little this year, but, like, I didn't see it. <laughs> they said the Hollywood sign was covered in snow. I said, okay, whatever. You know, <laughs> I didn't see it up close. I'm too far away. I'm, 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 I'm near the ocean. All right. Um, yeah, don't snow near the ocean, like, it didn't this year anyway but like i i don't know snow i don't know its soul you know i know i know hazy sunshine and i know like i was talking with gersham on slack this evening i mean i know um you know indian summer and that mess um <laughs> And the, oh, if you don't know, you don't know. But if you know, you know. If I think, Gosham, you said you've been to L.A. Indian summer, like September, October, sometimes even November. Yeah, we've had some hot Thanksgivings down here, let me tell you. Um, or, or Halloween night, it can be just boiling on <laughs> Halloween. <laughs> just horrible, freaking humid weather and hot, so freaking hot. Like, just imagine like Halloween, like all the rest of the um, United States or in most places, 
like you associate Halloween with kind of chilly weather. It's not winter, but it is autumn. And like there's supposed to be a chill in the air. And there's, you know, this is supposed to be the kind of weather where mothers force their children to wear jackets and, and stuff like that. Not down here. Oh, good heavens, no. It's it's nice. It's balmy, it, you know, usually. Um, and if it's like a particularly foul um, Indian summer, oh, it's going to be hot on Halloween night. Oof, terrible. Terrible. That's why all those uh, hoochies can get, get, get away with wearing those, you know, very revealing outfits because it is not cold. I'll tell you what, it's not cold down here uh, in October, usually. And in and fall autumn, fall, um, that's my favorite season of the year. I don't know why. I don't like pumpkin spice, but I do like pumpkin. Never mind all that. We're we're gonna try and locate the source of this here in The Shining. So, um, where was I going with this and why? Oh, anyway, yeah, Gershom and um, I was talking about about all of this and how I'm going to tell you all where I think all this snow is coming from. Because again, I'm not a native of snowy parts of pl places where there's actual winter in the United States. But those of you who, a lot of you who watch my channel, I know for a fact, you guys come from like cold places or places that really are cold in the winter. Um, and y'all tell me, okay, y'all tell me, my Southern Californian ass, you tell me, like in this in this movie that we're all obsessed with um can i enlarge it just a little okay there she is i think this is when she runs to the garage where the snow cat is um and is this normal what happens in this movie like one day it's like a nice fall day you know, and there, uh, and uh, Wendy and Danny are just hanging out and 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 roaming around in that maze and having a great time. Yeah, they're wearing jackets, but there's not one drop, there's not one flake of snow anywhere. And then all of a sudden, after, you know, after after Wendy listens, where's the thing? There she is. When she, after after this news report uh, about Susan, remember Susan? Um, mm, uh. <laughs> Uh, there's, you know, they say there's going to snow in Colorado and, you know, get ready for all the snow, get ready for it to be really cold. And, um, you know, they're still in like, what, like early November, according to the alleged, you know, timeline in the movie, it, they're in early November. Is that normal? For it to be like perfectly snow free one day, and then tomorrow everything is coated in thick layers, thick, thick layers of snow. Like, like, well, like this here. You know, this happened pretty quickly. And again, I don't know snow. I don't know how it breathes. I don't know how it behaves. I don't, I'm not, um, don't ask me about snow, slush, sleet, hail, none of that. I don't know weather. I'm from Los Angeles. We don't do weather here. We do 70 degrees. It, it, and that's like, some people, you're going to laugh, especially especially you, uh, Exorcist Refuse. Um, there are people down here in Los Angeles who just refuse to live and, and, and do anything un unless the heater is on in 70 degree weather. Now, I think that's a little bit much. You know, for me, it needs to be about 65 for me to turn the heater on. But I'm telling you, I'm telling you, we don't do cold down here. If I have to put shoes on, if I have to, oh no, oh no, 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 that's just too much. I got to turn the heater on. I got to wrap myself in my Afghan. Um, mm -mm, no, but yeah. So is that normal, you guys, for snow to just show up out of nowhere? For me, I have no idea. I have no idea. But anyway, so we're going to find it. We're going to find the source of this snow. And if it's anything like the source of, of, where's the damn thing? Hold on. Let me find that. Yeah. If it's anything like the source of the blood, which I told you, this is what I believe the source of the blood. Where is the damn thing? There she is. That's Carrie getting doused in pig's blood. That's what I think the source of the blood is in The Shining. The blood from the pig's blood that they play a horrible prank on Carrie. That's what I think the source of the blood is for The Shining. That That's the source of of this here. Okay. Um, 
I'm going to find the source of the snow. I think I will. And I told Gershom uh, about this <laughs> in the Slack. <laughs> and he posted a link to this song. Oh, I'm sorry. This is just too much. It's Black Sabbath, Snowblind. <laughs> and I said, oh lord, no. He's right, though. <laughs> he, he, he's absolutely right. <laughs> Look at the lyrics to this song if you've never heard it before, and you'll, you'll realize very quickly what's going on. Oh my god. So, <laughs> you know, I want to, like I said, I want to find out the source of this and this. Oh, and of course, this too. Okay, so, you know, <laughs> I, um, you gotta have to forgive me. I'm just enjoying this a little too much. Uh, we're, we're gonna find it. We are so gonna find it. Um, and I'm gonna invoke this, um, article again from my, was it this one? Oh, hold, hold on, hold on. Yeah, this one. Um, I, I featured this article maybe twice recently. Stanley Kubrick's 10 favorite horror movies. They say horror movies. Not all of these are horror movies. Like, the fa okay, The Phantom Carriage, yes. Rosemary's Baby. I don't know if I even call this a horror movie. Because it's it's t terrifying. And we talked about this tonight in the Slack, too. You, Me and, and Gershom and I think Dr. Luke uh, also made a couple of um, comments. But, like, I think one of y'all. Oh, and I, I can't, oh, forgive me, I can't, I can't remember who right now posted that scene of Mia Farrow, Rosemary, um, you know, with the Scrabble board and trying to figure out this, like, what is it called, an anagram? And I said, oh, wow. You know, to me, for some reason, that really grabbed my attention. And I was like, okay, this is one of Stanley's favorite movies. I'm not even going to say horror movies. I think these are probably just his favorite movies in general. Rosemary's Baby, it's not hard to see why he would like this, okay? I watched this one time. I watched this when I was a little kid, and I was sick at home from school or something. And it was nighttime, and it was spooky. And I think it was winter, because, yes, of course it was. That's why I was sick. And I, I was, I had the flu. I was congested like you wouldn't believe. And my, my mother was like, um, force feeding me like scalding hot tea. It's an ethnic thing you wouldn't understand. Um, <laughs> and I was like just lying in bed, like, like I was dying. And back in the day with cable and TVs that, um, you know, we're not flat as a pancake, a nice boxy TV. And <laughs> I was watching, I think it was like actually the Bravo channel and, they used to show really awesome indie films and foreign films on Bravo. The same show that shows like 24 hours of, of reality TV mess nowadays. Back in the day, y'all, back in the 90s, or yeah, this was the early 90s, um, they had some good movies on that channel. I wish they would do that again. And the, the other movie channels that we have now, IFC, Sundance, they don't comp, they, they pale in comparison to Bravo. Bravo is, is the channel where I watched for the first time the Jim Jarmusch movie, uh, A Night on Earth with Gina Rollins and Winona Ryder and Roberto Benigni and, um, there's Rosie Perez, and there's so many good performers in this movie. It's it's it, it'll take your breath away. It will take your absolute breath away. Um, who was in the? Oh, if you're a fan of Breaking Bad, like the the gangster dude, I've never watched Breaking Bad, but I know the characters somewhat. Like the guy who gets his, half of his face blown off in in that scene, he's in. Um, a Night on Earth with Jim Jarmusch. He's in the in the episode of the movie that takes place in New York City. Uh, he's an amazing actor. <laughs> you know, what, like amazing. Anyway, uh, sorry for my tangent. So I was, whew, all these movies, I think I've seen, I've seen Rosemary's Baby. I've definitely seen The Exorcist. Uh, T Texas Chainsaw, I haven't seen it. I've seen it in clips. It scares me a little too much. I'm sorry. And so Eraserhead, I've seen. American Werewolf, I've seen parts of it. This one, though, this one, 
the company of wolves. And I think you, Exorcist Reviews, um, <clears throat> in here you said you got a copy of it and you liked it. Yeah, you say you, I enjoy, I enjoy the company of wolves. I bought a copy years ago. Okay, so here, here I'm revisiting this list again, and bear with me, stay with me. I have a reason to do for doing this. Okay, but yeah. Uh, I already showed you the snowball. I might, I might as well just put this on my community page. It's an inspiration. Why am I, why am I up here with this? Okay. Um, I was doing some more research. All right. I'll call it what it is. Snooping, uh, about Stephen King because he, the, oof, this man's life is the, or at least his life prior to 1980, uh, is one of the keys in my opinion, for unlocking this movie that we're all obsessed with, The Shining. I haven't done my church announcements yet, but, you know, um, here, here we go. Um, returning viewers, thank you for returning. New viewers, thank you for being new subscribers. Thank you for subscribing. Please don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, and share. You know, you guys, I appreciate all of you. No, I don't have as many subscribers as I would like. No, I don't. YouTube, come on. Come on now. You, 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 you get, you can do better. All right. I'm going to blame YouTube now. Why, why not? Um, but I, all 433 of you, and the number does grow inch by inch, uh, as I, as I continue with this. And I'm grateful for all of you. I am grateful that there are 433 people on planet earth who actually want to hear what I have to say about all my nonsense. So that's good enough for me. But, um, and that's that with the church announcements. Anyway, I'm ba I went back to the Company of Wolves because I noticed something. And I think Stanley noticed something too. I'll get into it. But um, let me let me show you where I think you'll see pretty quickly, right? Um, where what I think the uh, source of the snow is in this movie. You can see it right here. It's It's an article from the cracked.com website uh, is from last year may approximately approximately a year ago a reminder stephen king loved cocaine mm -hmm. okay um <laughs> they they showcase this picture too of course they do it's snow um one night in 1988 or 1979 stephen king went to his garage and noticed to his horror that the trash can he reserved for recycling beer cans was full to the top. Quote, full to the top. Okay. Uh, why would that horrify the same brain that came up with Pennywise the Clown and the nudist ghost lady from The Shining? Because the trash can had been empty a week earlier and King was the only one in his family who drank beer unless his toddler and two young kids were really good at hiding beer breath. Oh my God. That's when King realized he had a bad drinking problem and should probably do something about it. Hold on a minute. Who wrote this? Nonsense. What in the world is this shit? <laughs> okay, so see, see why I don't trust this man, Stephen King. I don't trust him. Not even, not, no, not even one single solitary scrap. Do I trust him? The trash can that had been empty a week earlier and King... So, okay, in a week it filled up with beer cans. Okay. All right. You know, at least he was recycling. How was, how how nice of him, you know. Um, the trash can was full. Now, they don't tell us what size this trash can was. Was this like a waste basket? Or was it one of those big ones, like, the, you know, the old-fashioned ones that we used to put all our trash in back in the day? They don't tell us that. But it was full after a week. And if, if all he drank was beer, and that, that a trash can was full of a week's worth of beer cans, you can, maybe that's not very good for you. No. That's not good for you to drink that much beer. I'm not advocating that. But to me, that doesn't really sound like a raging alcoholic. Y'all tell me. Y'all let me know in the comments how y'all feel. Because, <clears throat> I don't know. That just doesn't sound like a, a terrible alcoholic to me. That sounds like, you know, a typical dude out here. You know, beach dude or whatever. That, mm, whatever. 
<sighs> but that's when Stephen King realized he had a bad drinking problem and should probably do something about it. Okay. And it says one night in 1978 or 79. He can't even, can't even decide on the year. All right. Anyway, and he did. He developed an, he, he did something about it and he did. He developed an even worse cocaine problem. Oh, and it says under this, uh, photo, picture this, but with something other than snow. Oh, for God's sake. Uh, King says he was a heavy user of the happy powder from 1978 till around 1986 when he was churning out bestsellers like It, Christine, Pet Cemetery, Misery, and Cujo, the classic tale of a murderous St. Bernard dog that King, quote, barely remembers writing it all, end quote. Oh, really? Okay. That he ba he barely remembers writing Cujo, so so I guess that's his excuse for not knowing that he wrote The Shining about himself. He, I mean, if he was on that much coke. Oh, oh my God! Yes, even his blackout drunk scrawl sells millions of copies and gets movie adaptations. Mm. Must be nice. <laughs> that's all I gotta say. <laughs> You could be a total, like, total uh, raging drunk and cokehead. And even his blackout drunk scrawls sell billions of copies that get movie adaptations. Ay, yeah, yeah. This is what they expect us to believe. This is what, this is how, this is how smart they think we are, which is not smart at all. Okay. We're now picturing King browsing novels at an airport bookstore and saying, A Killer St. Bernard? Who came up with... Oh. Yeah. Because he, he's just that dumb. I may be. He's making himself sound like a complete idiot, in my opinion. Um, yeah, under and under this picture, it says, of the Cujo cover, uh, what's next? Killer cars? Killer clowns? Killer menstruating teenagers? Yeah, I guess so, huh? Uh, in his memoir on writing king says that he was pushing so much junk up his nostrils that he had to write with cotton li listen to this y'all with cotton swabs stuck up my nose to stem the cocaine induced bleeding though that seems like a convenient way to save ink Oh, Lord, it's probably not a coincidence that this was also the most insanely prolific period of his career. Uh-huh. Oh, Lord. Again, this is a little too much for me. Uh, at one point, he was writing so many books that he invented a fake name so he could keep publishing them without the publishers whining about saturating the market. Mm-hmm. Okay. Oh, and keep in mind that King only killed off his alter ego because the secret got out. For all we know, half of all English language horror fiction published between 1978 and 1986 was written by a doped up Stephen King under various aliases that were never discovered. <laughs> okay, Cracked, I see you. I see what you're doing. Pretty much the same thing I'm doing, but okay. But you're, you're, you're a little smarter about it than I am. Um, so, uh, King was making lots of money and becoming more and more famous, but he was also deeply miserable. I used to, oh, ooh, okay, all right. Mm -hmm. Hence the book Misery, which, <laughs> I'm sorry, this is too funny for me, which is about a famous author being kept hostage by his biggest fan, a psychotic nurse called Annie Wilkes. Uh, according to King, Annie was my drug problem and she was my number one fan. God, she never wanted to leave. Oh, Lord. King felt as trapped as his character. Every attempt to quit his addiction was met with a harsher relapse, like Annie coming back with a mallet to break her beloved's feet. Basically, Kathy Bates won an Oscar for playing the personification of a pile of cocaine on King's desk. Yeah, okay. That's if he, that's if he wrote it. I mean, I don't know if I believe that. But at least misery resulted in a novel King could be proud of. The Tommyknockers, the novel after that, not so much. King has called it an awful book, and the point where his addiction was definitely making him a crappier writer. Oh. 
Oh, I, I don't know if I can read much more of this. Nope, nope, no, I'm gonna skip ahead a little bit. Uh, <laughs> nope. <sighs> I'm, I, I don't know if I can read much more of this. It's too much. I just don't know. Um, I read this whole thing when I was preparing for this, but like, I'm thinking, like, I don't want to torture you that much. But you guys, you can read the rest of it. <clears throat> I don't, I don't know. I, I just cannot trust this man. He, this, this is his explanation for why he's he was able to bust out that many novels and in, in such rapid succession i just don't i just don't buy it i personally just don't buy it i think it's another like pun intended yes i think it's another snow job by his publishers or whoever it is that's really at the um controls regarding him as a personality and and his career and whatever they needed an explanation they needed an explanation because his again i've 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 talked about this in my previous videos his output as an author makes absolutely no sense makes absolutely no sense um i i even compared it to like his wife's bibliography and i don't think i maybe it didn't show you Diane Johnson's bibliography, but it's much more believable. I mean, I, I looked it up and it's much, much more believable than Stephen King's. Go ahead and look it up on your own. Look up like, you know, most authors of the 20th century, their bibliography. It's believable. It's not like book after book after book after book and then short story after short story after short story after short story and, and plus all the unpublished shit. Like, that don't make no sense. And they, they, they blame, they blame Coke, um, right up until the year 1986 when he allegedly got clean. Um, okay. Like, it's not like he stopped writing a shitload of books, uh, after 1986. He kept going at like what can be characterized as at, at, he kept going at breakneck speed, um, churning out those books, you know, drugs or no drugs. So I think this is just a convenient little way for his people to explain his output and and how many books he he puts out and and how how he does it so quickly. Okay? So and I think if this is true. Again, I don't know. I'm not saying that he never did anything as far as um controlled substances, but I don't think that explains how quickly he could write because I don't think he wrote or if he wrote I think he had a whole lot of help that wasn't all him okay um that's just my opinion okay that's how I feel that's what I think if I'm wrong I'm wrong you know um but whatever and but I do think if he did maybe he did have some kind of substance problem um and I think maybe some something about that caught Stanley Kubrick's eye. Um, if he was doing that much of it, allegedly, like, let's just take it as a given that he was, and he met with Stanley Kubrick, and he was like coked out of his mind all of the time, according to him, you know. Did you read, did you hear what I just read to you? That he had to put like cotton or whatever up his nose so that he wouldn't bleed all over his typewriter while he was writing. That's insane. That sounds absolutely insane to me. But, you know, and it probably sounded absolutely insane to Stanley Kubrick, too. Or his, if he was that, you know, um, far gone. And Stanley Kubrick, like, had a conversation with this crazy man. Oh, he probably, you know, put it in the movie somehow. And that's my kind of argument for this video today. Um, so I found this, okay. It's from a website called Pop Horror, um, and all Stephen King books ranked by decade. I don't care about the ranks of this book. When I saw this, I this photo, okay, look at this. This is what stuck out to me. 
And I think you can see why. Um, <laughs> I said, what the fuck is this? <laughs> I said, what in the world is it? He looks like a lunatic in this picture. Okay? I said, uh-uh, no. This is, this is not okay. <laughs> and of course, I had to, like, find the origin of this. Um, so Tankard, I think you might particularly be interested in this. This is, I think this is from a publication from the University of Maine, um, where he went to college and graduated from college. And this is, this is, they're announcing his success. Like he says, ex-campus writer hits the big time. That's why I searched for this. I wanted the whole thing. I knew it was a part. I knew this was like a clipping from, from a newspaper article. I wanted the whole thing. So I found it. Okay, there it is. Ex-campus writer hits the big time. A former columnist for the main campus and an UMO graduate made his debut on the big money literary scene. The campus learned last week. This is what they called it? The big money literary scene? Sounds... Is somebody, like, making fun of him? Oh, my God. I don't know. I just don't know. Uh, Stephen E., King, author of a popular campus column of the late 60s, King's Garbage Truck, <laughs> okay, uh, learned last March, last March, that Doubleday and Co. Incorporated uh, purchased the hardcover rights to his novel Carrie for $2,500 plus royalties on sales. Doubleday expects to publish the hardcover version of the novel, which tells the story of a high school girl with telekinetic powers, ability to move spiritually, ability, sorry, ability to spiritually cause objects to move next January. Okay. King jumped into the big money bracket last week, however, when he learned from Doubleday that New American Library purchased the paperback rights to carry for a reported, okay, this looks like a typo, but I, I think it's $400,000. Okay, not $4,000, no, $400,000. Um, so when he learned from Doubleday that New American Library purchased the paperback rights to carry for a reported $400,000, King has been guaranteed 50% of that figure, plus royalties on sales. The paperback edition is expected to be published sometime early in 1975. Mm -hmm. Currently an English instructor at Hampton Academy, King is a 1970 graduate of UMO holding a BS in education. Oh, education. I thought it was English. I could be wrong. I don't know. Uh, prior to the sale of Carrie, he published several short stories in Cavalier and Adam magazines. Oh my. So, why am I, why, where am I going with this and why? Okay. Um, f uh, first I read you this article. The reminder, Stephen King loved cocaine. Um, then I showed you this because this is what I found. And then this evening I tracked down the origin of this. And I mean, they hated him. It looks to me like these people at the University of Maine probably just couldn't stand him because why would they use this picture? This is a, ooh, this is some, this is some not so subtle shade. Okay. They, ooh, they didn't, like, as the, as the saying goes, they didn't throw a little shade. They threw the whole damn three, tree, excuse me, at Stephen King with this. But why? I mean, they're announcing a success. They're announcing that he's hit the big time and he's, made his debut on the big money literary scene and they used this picture. Oh my god, I would I would hate them forever. If they used a picture of me that was, you know, comparable to this, I'd be like, oh no you didn't. Oh no you didn't. I'm gonna sue. If they, <laughs> if they put up a picture like of me looking, you know, like the female version of this, my God. Um No sir. No, ma'am. Nah. -uh. And as I was looking at this, this just, you know, this to me is just more evidence of yet more fuckery. 
with regard to Stephen King and his career, and again, more evidence as to why I think our Stanley picked up on all of that fuckery and said, you know what, let me deal with him. And and he did that as he was filming The Shining and throwing, you know, little, little, um, little, um, uh, little shade all over the place in the movie all of it directed at stephen king which is why he's still pissed to this day um and i saw him in this picture in this awful picture and i said wait a minute let me go back to this article uh-huh the company of wolves now when Tan uh, not tankard no exorcist review said that you got a copy of it and you liked it and i said let me look that up the company of wolves okay and this is one of uh stanley kubrick's favorite movies according to this article by screen rant 1984 the company of wolves now i don't know this is 1984 okay this is 1984 but um maybe it was published earlier it's a gothic fantasy novel directed by Neil Jordan and starring Angela Lansbury, David Warner, Misha Berges, and... Okay. Ah, there it is. Thank you, God. I knew it was here. Um, Mishka, Misha Berges and Sarah Patterson in her film debut. The screenplay was written by Jordan and Angela Carter and adapted by Carter from her short story of the same name featured in her 1979 short story collection, The Bloody Chamber. Okay, so it does predate um, the release of The Shining, at least the short story. And maybe Kubrick was aware of that. Maybe he was aware of this short short story, The Bloody Chamber, um, by Carter, who Angela Carter. Okay, Angela Carter. Okay, she was a um, an author published under the ha, 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 English novelist, short story writer, poet, and journalist, known for her feminist magical, magical realism and pic, picaresque works. Uh, she is best known for her book, The Bloody Chamber, which was published in 1979. Okay, cool. But it got made into a movie, or the movie was released in 1984. Okay. And there's a 1980 radio adaptation. Carter's first draft of the screenplay, which contains some differences from the finished film, has been published in her anthology, The Curious Room. Okay, cool. So the plot of this movie that uh, Stanley King... Stanley King, what the hell did I just say? St uh, Stanley Kubrick was a big fan of, according to this list. Um, the plot of the story in this movie... Uh, based on the short story by Angela Carter, in her sh published, featured in her short story collection, The Bloody Chamber, which makes me wonder, it's featured in her short story collection, but maybe it was published before, even before 1979, and the 1979, like, anthology was, a again, a collection of things that had been published in other places, possibly like magazines and what have you, before 1979, and maybe Kubrick knew about it i don't know i don't know i'm stabbing it like whatever here but oh let me read this first paragraph of the plot you might be surprised i know i was which is what when i saw this oh no this this that's what made me seek this out because i read this Okay, uh, here we go. The film begins in the present day with a country house, within a country house. A young girl named Rosaline, Sarah Patterson, dreams that she lives in a fairy tale forest during the late 18th century with her parents, uh, Tussie Silberg and David Warner, and her sister Alice, Georgia Slow. But one night, Alice is chased down and killed by wolves while her parents are mourning. Rosaline goes to stay with her grandmother, Angela Lansbury, who knits a bright red shawl for her granddaughter to wear. The superstitious old woman gives Rosaline an ominous warning. And this is it. This is the warning, y'all. Uh, never stray from the path. Never eat a windfall apple. And never trust a man whose eyebrows meet. Well, listen... Well, I mean, I know that the odds are not in my favor with regard to this. 
but there is a chance. <laughs> There's a chance, y'all. Um, never trust a man whose eyebrows meet. There he is. <laughs> I can't. I'm sorry. I'm having too much fun. But that, th so I, I just put this in here just as a little bit of fun because I'm talking about the origin of the snow in The Shining. Okay. What it, like I said in this is what, where does the blood come from? I'm trying to find out where the snow comes from. And my idea, you know, again, this, this has nothing to do with, well, it kind of does. Maybe he was like coked out of his mind when they took his picture of him. I don't know. I wasn't there, but, um, you know, this man is not shy about talking about his past. And, you know, like I said, maybe he's just using it as an excuse for churning out that many books that quickly, you know, or maybe he really did have a problem. I don't know what to believe anymore. This is the ultimate as, as far as like, tankered, you know, all unreliable narrators. Maybe Stephen King himself is an unreliable narrator when he's even talking about his own life. He has plenty of reason to lie because like all of his lies have made him lots and lots of money. Why would he stop now? Okay. In, in my, once again, that's my opinion. That's my opinion. So I, I saw, I saw this unibrow, you know, eyebrows meeting and and then I remembered the plot of the company of wolves and uh, the grandmother telling the daughter, uh, never trust a man whose eyebrows meet. So if he was as, as far gone on this substance as it's said that he was or that he, or that he wants everybody to believe that he was to the point where the river of blood coming out of his nose um would drip down onto his typewriter and he had to plug up his nose with what was it cotton or kleenex or tampons or i don't know what to make sure that his typewriter didn't get all bloody from nosebleed blood from doing way 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 too much coke uh, maybe that's another source of the blood i didn't cover that in this video okay maybe you know you know maybe it's carrie maybe it's the pig's blood from the prank or maybe it's the blood coming from Stephen King's nose. I have no idea. I have no idea. But this man, he's, he's just too much. Which led me to start thinking, wait a minute. Okay, wait a minute. What if Jack and Wendy are also a little slow, snow blind themselves? Okay? And... I said, wait a minute, what if they're both, both Jack and Wendy? I've already explored the possibility of Wendy um, having a substance abuse issue. Like I said, maybe, she, maybe she's, you know, in, I'm not talking about that goddamn book. I'm talking about the movie. I'm talking about Stanley Kubrick's The Shining, not Stephen King's The Shining. No, no. Um, I've already talked about the possibility of Wendy having a substance abuse problem, whether it's alcohol or coke. I, and I've, I've said before, in the in the movie, in Stanley Kubrick's uh, movie, you know, maybe it's not Jack who has the problem. Maybe Jack isn't the one who's the alcoholic or the, you know, substance abuser. Maybe it's Wendy. And maybe she's the one who's, you know, what we're seeing in, in the movie um, is like cocaine psychosis. I think, yeah, I have talked about that possibility before. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read you a little bit of stuff here from these handy dandy websites that I, I, I was like, well, you know, I've never had a problem with, you know, thankfully, I've never had a substance abuse problem. And I've never gone through any of this that I'm going to read to you about. But that's why I needed to look it up. Because I have no experience, really. Um, at, not at this level. Oh, good heavens, no. Um, so, that's yeah, like I said, that's why I needed to look this up. And to know what's going on, you know. So, I will do that. First, I need to go get a little coffee. <sighs> and then I will continue. 
and I've got a little surprise for you at the end. Thanks to, um, oh, oh, good heavens, I it, somebody named Rob in the Slack discussion board that Dr. Luke runs. Uh, he posted a photograph on there, and I thanked him on Slack, and I'm thanking him again if he's watching this video. Thank you, Rob, for putting up that photo. I'm going to use that as, like, our little after-dinner mint for when I'm done um, with this uh, video about uh, cocaine psychosis. So, <laughs> and the source of the snow, uh, or the snowstorm in The Shining, so... Stay tuned. I'll be right back after my coffee. All right, I'm back. I am back. Did you miss me? Whatever. Um. So anyway, I found these articles. Okay. I said, what the hell is going on? Um. Says here in this article, what is cocaine psychosis and how long does it last? Um. It says when people use cocaine. They are usually seeking the effects of euphoria, increased energy, and decreased need for sleep. However, they also tend to disregard the potential risks. Cocaine has the ability to negatively impact numerous aspects of a person's life and well-being. Physically, cocaine can have dangerous side effects, such as cardiac issues and severe weight loss. Wendy is pretty skinny. Oh, okay. Cocaine use can also create many negative consequences mentally, including the possibility of cocaine psychosis. What is cocaine-induced psychosis? Well, uh, with both short-term and long-term use, cocaine wreaks havoc on the body. Possible cocaine side effects include, here they are, improved mood, high energy, hypersensitivity to light, sound and touch maybe now we know why those chandeliers in the colorado lounge are not lit when jack and wendy have their like first serious scene in that room and i was always wondering like why these chandeliers in those in the center of the room are not lit Everything is, I, I mentioned it, I said it, I remember saying it in this video, that like all of this is indirect light, where he's writing it's actually kind of dark. There's this lamp, but come on, you know, so I did not know, I did not know that there's a hypersensitivity to light, sound, and touch. Oh lord, uh, increased body temperature, hmm, interesting. Higher blood pressure, anxiety, panic, and irritability. Okay, so those are the side effects of using it. Um, it says, uh, psycho what is psychosis? Um, the, 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 uh, it says, these, though these effects have a negative impact on the individual, cocaine-induced psychosis can harm the person using the drug as well as those around them. Oh, my. Uh, psychosis is a term used to describe a situation where a person is removed from reality. During a period of psychosis, the person's thoughts, feelings, and behaviors are no longer matching up with the world around them. In a psychotic state, uh, the person is sure that their perceptions are entirely accurate. In truth, their pers perspectives can be dangerously far from reality. What do we talk about in this video? You know, um... Alman tells her that there's nothing out of the ordinary at the hotel and that it's understandable that she was basically hallucinating um, and having some kind of mental breakdown after what she's been through. Okay. And I think it was Rich in Law who, like, who, who offered up, like, a, a more logical um, interpretation of that dialogue and it, i think it was you rich in law don't have the time to look it up but you i think you said like okay after you 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 pointed out like the emphasis on after what she's been through okay so if something happened at the hotel and i guess ullman is saying that it's you know no wonder you were hallucinating or having a breakdown um after what you've been through but like if if i'm right about this Maybe 
it's the Coke. Or maybe it's, you know, some, somehow it's connected to both her and Jack's um, reliance upon that substance. But it says, you know, um, their, their person's thoughts, feelings, behaviors are no longer matching up with the world around them. In a psychotic state, the person is sure that their perceptions are entirely accurate. Sounds a lot like Wendy. In truth, their perspectives can be dangerously far from reality. Um, cocaine psychosis may occur in more than 50% of people who use this drug. Other stimulants such as methamphetamine and me medications used for ADD or ADHD uh, may produce psychosis as well. This occurs because people addicted to stimulants like cocaine commonly binge on the drug by consuming very large amounts over a period of hours or days. This binging period can cause cocaine psychosis. And like, you know, um, there's an issue with sleep in this movie. Like I said, all of these people, Jack, Wendy, um, or Wendy is like the least oh, haggard looking, but Jack definitely looks haggard. The boy looks haggard, like he's sleep deprived. I said, I've said it so many times when doing videos about this, anal um, analyzing this movie, or just like my understanding, the shining videos, they, there's, there's an issue with sleep. There's an issue with sleep in this movie and they look sleep deprived and they look kind of high strung, um, nervous, anxious, whatever, but like there's a decreased need for sleep. Okay. And that would explain a lot. That would explain, I don't think the little boy is on drugs, but the parents definitely. And that would explain why if you've seen the movie before, there's that scene with Jack and when Danny goes into the apartment because he wants to go get his fire engine and Jack is just, you know, Wendy says, oh, don't bother your father. He's sleeping. Okay. Um, and Danny walks in and sees, sees Jack in his blue robe that Wendy later wears in the movie and he's just sitting on the bed staring into space. And, you know, uh, Jack says, you know, he loves the hotel and he's very happy there and he's just, um, but he's just tired. And then Danny asks him, you know, why don't you go to sleep if you're tired? And Jack says, I, I can't, I just can't. Well, if he's all coked up, um, that would explain that or one aspect of that. Like, these people don't seem to sleep in this movie. And sleep is an issue. Sleep is a very, very serious issue uh, in this movie. And again, if this hotel is what I think it is, a brothel. And if Stuart Ullman is what I think he is, a pimp. And, you know, and their people recommended Jack. Their people in, what was it, Denver? Recommended Jack. Like, I, we always... I've been wondering, I think you have been too, like, who are their people in Denver? Well, if he's a pimp and that's a brothel, though their people are probably not like, you know, they're, they're probably not like upstanding law abiding citizens. Uh, maybe they're involved not just with the sex trade, but also with the drug trade. Um, I'm just saying, and you know, maybe that's where the drugs come from because if jack knows their people in call in denver and their people recommended jack to ullman and for once he agrees with them um then that means jack is involved with people who sell drugs and also um you know run a brothel for God's sake, they they seem, you know, those two things seem to go together quite often. Uh, the sex trade and the drug trade. I'm just saying. <sighs> but anyway, um, so the binging period, uh, very large amounts over a period of hours or days. This binging period 
can cause cocaine psychosis, okay? There's also alcohol-induced schizophrenia, uh, the pink elephants that we've all heard of, right? But in old movies, when they say that pink elephants, that's what it means. Uh, cocaine psychosis symptoms, people are ex will experience a range of uncomfortable and dangerous symptoms during a period of psychosis. Some of the most common uh, cocaine psychosis symptoms include paranoia, Okay, an extreme sense of suspiciousness are some of the first symptoms linked to cocaine-induced psychosis. In this state, people begin to mistrust the people around them and their surround. Does that sound familiar? Oh, it should. Sounds exactly like Wendy to me. Uh, they may become suspicious of loved ones, law enforcement, or government agencies. These symptoms are not rare, as with many of the 84% of users reporting cocaine-induced paranoia. Okay, that next one, cocaine delusions. Uh, as paranoia increases, people may develop delusions. These are unrealistic thoughts and beliefs a person experiences about themselves and the world around them. For example, delusions may involve someone thinking the police are conspiring against them or that they are in an incredibly gifted genius. Okay. Uh, cocaine hallucination. Someone with cocaine psychosis will likely experience flawed sensory perceptions called hallucinations. Hallucinations can make people think that they are seeing, hearing, touching, smelling, or tasting something that is not there. The most common form of cocaine hallucinations is auditory, which means hearing something that is not present. Okay. And last but not least, violence. Uh, as the person is confused and paranoid, there is a higher risk of distress and agitation. People may be in danger of causing harm to themselves or others around them. In the worst situation, someone experiencing a stimulant-induced psychosis could kill. Um, now do you see why I think <laughs> this applies to our movie, The Shining, directed by our Stanley? Kubrick. Let me know in the comments whether or not you think I'm on to something here, okay? Um, the cocaine psychosis symptoms will vary from person to person, but the danger is always present. People thinking about using the substance must know the risks. Okay, how long does it last? Well, there's no set timeline for the length of stimulant psychosis. When someone is experiencing a cocaine psychosis, they could feel the effects as long as they are intoxicated. Uh, several factors dictate how long the intoxication will last, including um, the type of drug consumed, the dose or amount used, the route of administration, snorted, injected, or smoked, the person's tolerance to the substance, alcohol or other drugs being used in combination. Okay, um, most of, I'm going to skip down to here. Most of the time, cocaine psychosis effects end a few hours or days after the last use. People must practice caution, though, because these unwanted symptoms can last for a month in some cases. Okay, this is what caught my eye because, you know, um, well, after they move into the hotel, after closing day, after they get the camera walk tour by Ullman and everything. Okay, and then after that, after that whole thing is over where they, they get a tour of the hotel, um, then we see that card that says, like, a month later. That's why this caught my eye. It says it can last for a month in some cases. Like, goddamn. Okay, so a month later, um... We see the family. A month later, the first thing we see is Wendy wheeling Jack his breakfast in the cart up to their room. At like, and he asks her, "What time is it?" And she says, "Eleven thirty. And okay, that's the last time we see anybody sleeping before um, the big showdown. Not the big showdown, but like um, the scene in the Colorado Lounge where Jack is having his nightmare. So the only time we see somebody sleeping in this movie is Jack. And that's when she's bringing the breakfast into their room. And then later on his table, he's got his head on the table in the Colorado lounge. Okay. But that breakfast thing that happens a month after the hotel closes. So like I said, it seems to be that they're doing okay for the first month that they're there. And they're staying up late and, you know, probably watch, I mean, I assume, watching TV, 
whether it's plugged in or not, whatever. Um, and they're doing okay for the most part. Nobody's getting violent. Nobody's getting crazy. Nobody's, you know, for a month, nobody's had any hallucinations. Nobody's seen any ghosts or skeletons or bears or, you know, none, none of that for a month. Then after that month, kaboom, all shit goes all the way to hell. Now, <laughs> um, this, this is the article and <sighs> I was like, wow, it can last a month. I mean, it probably, like it says, it depends on how much of it you're using and how you're using it and whatever, but that's still suspicious. A month? Wow. Uh, then there's cocaine paranoia. Okay, I found this. How long does cocaine paranoia last? Well, let's see. How long is this damn article? Um, well, here we go. Signs of cocaine paranoia. I don't know if this is like synonymous with cocaine psychosis, but here we go. Some, some symptoms, sim, some signs and symptoms of cocaine paranoia involve suspicion of other people's actions, ex exaggerated mistrust of strangers, fear of close friends or family members without reason, questioning what other people are up to, believing that other people do not recognize your role in the world, okay, thinking that people are looking at you suspiciously, assuming there are hidden... <laughs> okay, that's a good one. That's good. Assuming that... <laughs> <laughs> oh okay let me read it all the way through assuming there are hidden messages behind music movies or advertisements <laughs> well i told you i'm not on coke i promise you and neither are ne neither are any of you right we just like this movie that's it that's it it's okay it's okay there's nothing wrong with any of us we're all fine um yeah uh, feeling that everyone is out to get you. Okay. Uh, seeing or hearing suspicious things that aren't really happening. Okay. Um, uh, Lord. Okay. So those are the symptoms, signs and symptoms. Okay. What is it? Uh, someone who heavily abuses cocaine can experience paranoia, which is a feeling of suspiciousness towards other people and the world. Usually paranoia comes as a result of the hallucinations where an addict feels like someone is attacking them or following them. According to a study by the American Journal of Psychology, more than half of the people who abuse cocaine experience paranoia after use. The onset of paranoia is characterized by suspiciousness. In severe cases, paranoia causes a person to act aggressively towards other people. Again, does that sound familiar uh, with regards to the mo movie? Okay, they talk about hallucinations, they talk about psychosis, depression, um, and whatever, right? And this is the it, this is the part that I, I really am interested in. Um, how long does it take for cocaine paranoia to stop? There's no set timeline for drug-induced paranoia. In some instances, paranoia might last for only a few hours. Others go on for weeks, months, and in severe cases... Paranoia can take years if drug use is continued. Okay. Even after the drug leaves your body, paranoia might still show itself as your brain readapts to functioning without substances. And that's kind of what I was talking about a second ago. The first month they spend in the hotel, pretty uneventful, as far as we can assume, because Stanley doesn't show us anything that happens in the first month. He shows us a month later. Okay, a month later, she's carting his breakfast to him, and everything seems okay. And we can assume, I guess, that the whole month, everything was okay. And here it's telling us that if you're like, seriously, if you seriously have a problem with this substance, this, this shit, this paranoia thing can last, what does it say here? Years. Okay years oh my god is that what's going on with these people it i mean i don't know is it just wendy or is it wendy and jack who are having these crazy hallucinations and delusions and what have you y'all tell me in the comments what do you think so that's how long it take or it can take for it to stop years
Oh my God, what to do? Okay, no, I can't. Remember. Okay, no, um, not gonna. But this is I. This is that's what caught my eye in this article. Gonna leave them all in the description as usual. Uh, moving on to the next article: cocaine withdrawal. This is from Med Medline Plus. Okay, so I'm thinking maybe the first month they were at the hotel, living there, at the Overlook everything was going fine because they probably had you know they hadn't run out of their stash yet okay I, I mean I don't know where they if I'm right about this if I'm right about Jack and Wendy being a couple of cokeheads with a serious coke problem um, maybe everything was going fine at the hotel because they brought plenty of coke with them I don't know and then when it ran out <laughs> That's when the trouble began. And so I'm thinking maybe they're having a combination of like um, cocaine psychosis, which includes cocaine paranoia, and then there's the withdrawal. Okay. Um, it says here, cocaine withdrawal occurs when someone who has used a lot of cocaine cuts down or quits taking the drug. Symptoms of withdrawal can occur even if the user is not completely off cocaine and still has some of the drug in their blood. Uh, cocaine produces a sense of euphoria, uh, extreme mood elevation, by causing the brain to release higher than normal amounts of some chemicals. But cocaine's effects on other parts of the body can be very serious or even deadly. Um, when cocaine use is stopped or when a binge ends, a crash follows almost right away. The cocaine user has a strong craving for more cocaine during the crash. Other symptoms include fatigue, lack of pleasure, anxiety, irritability, sleep, sleepiness, and sometimes agitation or extreme suspicion or paranoia. Y'all, um, cocaine, oh. Click to keep reading. Okay, cocaine withdrawal has often has no visible physical symptoms, such as the vomiting and shaking that accompany withdrawal from heroin or alcohol. Symptoms of cocaine withdrawal may include agitation and restless behavior, depressed mood, fatigue, general feeling of discomfort, decreased appetite. They don't eat a lot in this movie. I, I've noticed that. Uh, vivid and unpleasant dreams, slowing of activity. Okay. Uh, the craving and depression can last for months after stopping long-term heavy use. Withdrawal symptoms may also be associated with suicidal thoughts in some people. Uh, during withdrawal, there can be powerful, intense cravings for cocaine. The high associated with ongoing use may become less and less pleasant. It can produce fear and extreme suspicion rather than euphoria. Even so, the cravings may remain powerful. Okay, and it and it tells you how to like test for it or whatever. Okay, what I'm and this is my, again another part of my theory, that again they probably had enough to get them through a month. You know enough coke to get them through a month, um, and then I guess they ran out of it, and that's when all this shit started happening, and they, either one or both of them, Wendy and Jack, went crazy. Okay. With the psychosis and the paranoia and the withdrawals, um, withdrawal symptoms. And that's when like the shit went all the way to hell. I don't know. I don't know. What say you? What say you? To me, it's looking more and more that way. And again, let me, you know, kind of just remind you, I believe that Jack and Wendy are a rep or, you know, especially Jack is Kubrick's um partially partially um Kubrick's representation of the author of the novel The Shining okay if if we're we're going to believe that he was this raving maniac on cocaine rivers of blood coming out of his nose like getting getting all over the keys of his typewriter and he had to plug it up with whatever, cotton, tampons, whatever, just so he could type. <sighs> mm -mm. Mm -mm. Stanley, Stanley, Stanley. Um, but, you know, this is, this is what I'm thinking. 
this is what I'm thinking. This, I believe that that is the source of this. That's where the snow was coming from. All right. So they're, they're surrounded by snow. They're surrounded by snow. And, you know, the, maybe not the snow itself, but the effects of the snow eventually uh, wreaks havoc on, on this family, on these two characters, Wendy and, and Jack. I have one more article here. Oh, yeah. This is just to, like, re-emphasize. Um, like I said, either he was arranging Cokehead, or that's just his excuse. That's how he provides an explanation for his, like, crazy output as as an author like how did he says right here how does stephen king write so fast learn the secrets to the master of horror success i mean if he's if he's telling the truth about his past one of those secrets is coke okay <laughs> i don't know if he puts that in here but um in this article but as he as he got more and more famous the the unibrow disappeared i mean i don't know if you noticed that either <laughs> who would think that, that <laughs> that he would be vain i guess so <laughs> i'm just being a bitch tonight let um, i'll just i'll just be honest with you um he <laughs> says here oh this is a good one that i now i know why i saved it for last um the master of horror is an anomaly but he still has valuable lessons for any writer who is willing to listen okay all right see oh look at this shit Hold on, let me show you. Uh, renowned American horror novelist and short fiction writer Stephen King, born Stephen Edwin King, I think isn't isn't one of uh, Jack's middle names in the book. He's John uh, Daniel Edward Torrance. Yeah, and he's Edwin. Oh dear. He was born in 1947 in Portland, Maine, the state in which so many of his famous stories would someday unfold. He grew up poor. Okay, and struggle financially in his young adulthood. King graduated from the University of Maine in 1970 with a bachelor's degree in English. English? I thought it was in education. Where does it say here, education? Yep. He's currently an English instructor at Hampton Academy. King is a 1970 graduate of UMO, holding a BS in education. Okay, somebody got it wrong. Either these people who wrote this old article got it wrong, or like he's lying about that too. Now it's English. Okay. Um, he supported himself while writing short stories by teaching and working as a janitor, among several other jobs. His first novel, Carrie, was published in 1974 and was an immediate popular success. Immediate, y'all. Immediate. Mm. It was the first of many novels in which King blended horror, fantasy, the macabre, and science fiction elements. Okay. Uh, to date, Stephen King's books have sold 400 million plus copies worldwide, with many of them also adapted to feature films, TV movies, and comic books. He's not known as the master of horror for nothing, after all. And this article was written in... Where's the damn date? I hate it when they don't put the date. That makes me very angry. But whatever. They want to be sloppy, they can be sloppy. Um, anyway, uh, King75 has published 64 novels and counting, including seven under the pen name Richard Bachman and five non-fiction books. He has written over 200 short stories, most of which have been compiled in collections. The question here is, how on earth... Does Stephen King write so fast? I like to know, too. How does Stephen King write so fast? Okay, this is, I guess, a picture of him in his study. You know, this is the, I guess, he. this looks like his um, cocaine period. Uh, I don't see any blood on that typewriter, but never mind me. Never mind me at all. And the typewriter is gray. It's very similar to the color of the typewriter. Um, you know, first it's beige, and then it's like this charcoal gray color in the movie. I don't know. I just don't know. 
But here we go. Um, in, in 2016, fellow best-selling author George R. R. Martin sat down for a deep-dive discussion with Stephen King, during which he asked the famously prolific novelist, How the fuck do you write so many books so fast? <laughs> this is fucking rich. Okay. Um, George. <laughs> I wonder, I mean... I wonder why George R. R. Martin asked him that question. He's probably just as suspicious as I am. Um, and he said, I think, oh, I've had a really good six months. I've written three chapters, Martin continued. Oh, oh, Martin, this is Martin talking. Um, he says, I think, oh, I've had a really good six months. I've written three chapters, Martin continued. And you finished three books in that time. Um, here's the thing replied King. There are books, and there are books. Uh-huh. Really? Mm -hmm. He went on to explain that he writes for three or four hours every day and tries to produce half a dozen fairly clean pages in that daily period. This sounds less like an author and more like somebody working in, in, in a sweatshop, if you ask me. Okay. So if the manuscript is, say... 360 pages long. That's basically two months' work, but that's assuming it goes well. So he can... So wait a minute. Wait a goddamn minute. So he's saying that he basically writes like clockwork, like a machine, basically. 360 pages, and he can say that that he every day he produces about six pages, and... Okay, 360 divided by 6, that's 60 days, so two months' work. So he can he can predict his work output that accurately? I mean, really. This man thinks we're all idiots, including George R. R. Martin. He thinks George R. R. Martin is an idiot, because George R. R. Martin is I just asked the question that I would love to ask. Of course, you know, I... I I don't believe that I would ever get an honest answer, and I don't think this is an honest answer either, but, you know, other people are noticing. This article is showing this that other people are noticing. Other authors are noticing, like, something ain't right. Something ain't right. And, okay, so, you know, George R. 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 Martin says, like, you know, he's had a good six months when he's written three chapters in those six months. And he's like, he's saying to Stephen King, you finished three books in that time. Three months, three books. Or six months, three books. Oh. So basically, the, let me just put it this way. I've been around artists in my life. Okay? I have, like... That's not weird to me. That's not any new thing for me, being around people who create art. Um, freelance, you know, they're not working for a company or, or whatever. Just artists, painters, people who do that for a living. I don't. I'm not like freaked out by being around an artist who's actively producing artwork. It's kind of like my life. It, not 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 as an art creator, but as as somebody who's like there, um, and around that, and I've been that all my life. Now, in my experience with art, and I'm talking about visual art now. I'm not talking about writers. I'm talking about visual artists. The only time an artist like works like that, and they have to, um you know, force themselves to create stuff, whether they really feel like it or not, and do it like on a schedule and and do like, you know, predictable work is when they are under the gun, when they have a deadline, when they're working for a magazine, or, you know, in the old days, everything was illustrated by artists. Um, those people were worked every day and they had to produce, you know, such and such by such and such date or else. That's when they work that way. But an artist who's painting like a painting and it's their own work and they're not under the gun, they're not um, constrained by deadlines. Yeah, they do work because they love working, but it's not like this. It's not that, it's not that predictable. It's not like an artist saying who produces oil paintings, for example, 
that artist, in my experience, they don't say, okay, I've got to make one every week. I've got to, I've got to do, you know, uh, whatever size oil painting. I've got to churn one, one out every week. No, it doesn't work that way. Okay. I don't think that unless you're the kind of artist who works like somebody who, who's paid by the hour or by the project or whatever, you're not under the gun like that. You're not, you, they don't, you, you don't have this deadline hanging over your head and you get to work more or less whenever you want to. But he's basically just kind of admitted that he works like a machine because he's beholden to something or someone. And he, he, to me, it sounds like this is a person who has deadlines that cannot be missed no matter what. And again, I don't believe he does all of his writing all by himself. I just don't. I, if he does any writing, he has a lot of help, I think, in the form of ghost writers. That is my feeling. That is my opinion. Okay, that's assuming it goes well. Now, how many words does Stephen King write per day? Mm -hmm. In 2002, Stephen King had the audacity to publish <laughs> that, that. That's not in the article. I put that there. <laughs> Stephen King had the, um, I'm sorry. No, let me, let me be serious. In 2002, Stephen King published on writing a memoir, a memoir of the craft in order to share his writing philosophy and techniques <laughs> with other would be word, wordsmiths. Ah, yeah, yeah. I said audacity. Yes, I did. Oh, um, in his book, King addresses his writing pace. He sets a daily goal of about 2,000 words, mm -hmm. which aligns with what he later told Martin. Of course it aligns. He's not going to change his story. Oh, my God. Um, this would add up to roughly 180,000 words produced in three months. Y'all, you know how much, how many words approximately? I don't know if you've ever counted them. Maybe you have. Like you were in school, you had, you did word counts and your, your teacher, or your professor said a thousand words. And you, at the time when you were doing school, you had an idea of how many words could fit onto one typewritten page. Okay. I know for sure. Um, on one eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper, uh, you know, one inch margins, double spaced times, a uh, new Roman size 12 font is going to be approximately 250 words per page. Okay. So he says 2000 words a day. That's about eight pages. All right. About, he said six up here, but I, I'm telling you it's approximately, it, it changes. Of course it's, it's variable, but approximately 250 words per page. So that 2000 words would be eight pages. Okay. Uh, 180,000. Oh Lord. Uh, so wait, 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 100, 180,000. So 1000 words is what, what did I say? Four pages. Uh, so four times 180, that's 400 and uh, 320. That's 720 pages in three months time. <sighs> I hope I got the math right. Cause I don't, I didn't do it. I didn't use a calculator. Um, maybe I should have, I uh, never mind. but you, you, you get what I'm trying to say. You understand me. Um, mm, suspicious as hell, suspicious as hell. And he says, having a solid morning routine can make a world of difference, both with regard to staying in the right mindset, as well as trying to produce a specific number of pages or words per day. This is ridiculous. Oh, does that include the cocaine? Stephen, I mean, you know, for up until 1986, allegedly, according to you and your ridiculous story, up until 1986, you said you, you, you were just shoveling it up your nose like a madman. Okay. Like a maniac. I mean, snow blind is an understatement according to what he himself says about his own history, about his own past. He doesn't talk about the Coke in this article. Um, morning routine. He makes himself sound like an athlete, like an Olympic athlete. Come on now, Stephen. Come on now. 
Uh, King also wrote that three months was the maximum amount of time it should take, ideally, to finish the first draft of a novel, because if it takes longer, it becomes more challenging to dive back in with the right mindset. Three months is how much your pub how much time your publisher gives you. Okay, you need to churn out books like, you know, like 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 a maniac chicken laying eggs. That nerve, the audacity, the obnoxiousness, the pluck. I mean, really, I can't believe. I cannot believe the lies this man expects us all to believe. Unsurprisingly, King also participated in marathon writing sessions. Notably, well, <laughs> notably, he wrote The Running Man in just one week. Again, was this pre or post um, rehab? I don't know if he even went to rehab. I know he said his wife staged an intervention when she found some beer cans. Again, with the beer cans in his office and like uh, his other paraphernalia and what ha oh sure sure she did that's what because that's what you do that's what most wives do of of highly successful men who earn millions and millions and millions of dollars they boss them around <laughs> that's what they do they don't you know no 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 i don't believe that for a second no nope, i don't uh apply king's techniques to your writing really I don't think so. I've never done coke, and I, and I don't want to. Um, first things first. Understand that Stephen King is an anomaly. Oh, this is good. Uh, I'll read it again. First things first. Understand that Stephen King is an anomaly, an exception to the usual rules. That's what I've been saying for a little while now. Uh, while budding writers can learn a ton from his process, you should never feel inadequate because you don't write or publish at a comparable wit rate. No one does. Whew. I told you, they're not throwing a little shade, they're throwing the whole goddamn tree. No one does. No one. <laughs> He's an anomaly. He's an anomaly. Oh, they, they, they I mean, they could, they, mm. This is this is the people who wrote this article, um, and the and the cracked article. Like they they're saying everything, but they're saying everything and and going as far as they can, right up into the point where, you know, the 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 only thing that they aren't saying because they can't, is that this man is a complete fraud. Okay, that's how that is my belief. That is my belief. That said, there are still ways. To apply Stephen King's techniques and overall ethos to your writing endeavors. The following two foundational principles can help you form a healthy and fruitful writing practice. Uh, write for yourself because you love it. Oh, really? Yeah, okay. Uh, read and write constantly. Uh, okay, let me read it, just because why not? Uh, King is an undeniable talent uh-huh his books have the ability to captivate a wide audience due to their realistic detail and his incredible ability to engage and therefore scare the reader i don't believe that for one second i think that his books are like a farm to table that he, he, he and his publishing people and whoever it is that runs him uh, have a farm-to-table relationship with Hollywood. Stephen King's the farm, Hollywood is the table, and his books just get sent around to directors and studios and whatever, and they basically have no choice but to pick one of them. And because there's some crazy, like, deal or contract that everybody's beholden to. That's my opinion, that's what I think. Um... Nonetheless, he has at times been criticized and dismissed as undisciplined and inelegant. Uh-huh. Because because the people who have criticized and dismissed him can't say what's really going on, that he's a fraud. I mean, this George R. R. Martin guy, the the one in this article, he, he tried. He, he Again, he couldn't say the real thing, but he tried. Um, perhaps this is why he insists that writers must write for themselves instead of aiming to please others. Oh, you mean like your publisher, Stephen? And whoever it is that, that you're beholden to? Come on now. How? By writing what they love and care about, according to King. If you love something, you should be able to do it forever. <laughs> and enjoy the process. Okay. Here's the second one. 
Read and write constantly. One of Stephen King's most famous quotes is, If you want to be a writer, you must do two things above all else. Read a lot and write a lot. Mm -hmm. This makes me think of something. Can you guess? Uh, if you're a King fan, you'll have heard this piece of advice many times. As a prolific writer, uh, as prolific a writer as he is, King somehow still manages to read about 80 books a year. There's 12 months in a year. There's 52, usually, sometimes 53, weeks in a year. And he's saying he not only writes as much as he does, he also reads 80 books a year. That's more than one book a week. Where does he find the time? Especially if he's not on coke anymore. Mm, I don't know. According to King, if you don't have time to read, you don't have time. You don't have the time or the tools to write. Oh, so is he admitting that he just plagiarizes? Or, you know, steals ideas from people? Is that what this means? And when I said that this reminds me of something, can you guess? Um, all the books in the Torrance's apartment. Okay. That's what it reminds me of. And I don't know if that's in the book. I don't know if all those books in, in the par the apartment, um, in, what is it, Boulder? When the apartment where um, Danny has his first, like, episode and, you know, where they're Danny and, and Wendy having the peanut butter jelly sandwich for lunch and whatever. All the books. Everywhere in that apartment. And I'm thinking, like, Stanley put that there for a reason. Stanley put all those damn books there for a reason. He's trying, to, I mean, the, you cannot, um, you can't not notice. You can't overlook all of those books in that apartment. And, I, and that got me to thinking, especially when I kind of had my little epiphany about Stephen King being a fraud and writing that many books in such a short amount of time and becoming that famous that quickly, uh, like immediate success. I think one of these articles said that immediate success. Um, all those books, like he has to get his ideas from somewhere. You know, that's why <laughs> you know, Wendy's the one who's, who's a, 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 a ghost story and horror book fanatic. Is that what Jack says in the movie? She happens... The only book we see her reading is The Catcher in the Rye. <laughs> I mean, is that a horror horror book? Is that a ghost story? I don't know. You all tell me in the comments. But, um, golly. So this is where I, that's where I think the snow comes from in uh, The Shining. I think it's, uh, where is it? Yeah, reminder, Stephen King loved cocaine. Yeah, there, I mean, mm, y'all. Look at it. It's just, it's, that's a lot. That's a lot. Ooh, Lord, that's a lot. But, okay, y'all, and like I said, I think maybe Wendy, or maybe both Wendy and Jack are a couple of cokeheads having, like, cocaine psychosis or paranoia and then withdrawal symptoms after, like, their stash runs out after their first month at the hotel. Um... <laughs> That's what I think. Okay, that's what I think. And I've been talking, oh Lord, for about an hour and 38 minutes. And I'm still not done. I still have a little, like I said, a little after dinner mint for you. Um, This. Okay, so one of the people, uh, I think his name is Rob. Rob, yes. In the Slack um, discussion board, he put this up. And I thanked him, and I said, thank you. And it's, I think, a production photo of 2001, A Space Odyssey. And I'm, I'm, I'm looking, uh, the, the photo that I'm showing you here is from the Internet Movie Database. But it's, a, it's the same photo that Rob put up in the Slack discussion board. And then you see Stanley in the mirror he, over here. Interesting that they put a mirror above a bathtub in this... I guess, you know, the whatever room in 2001. I need to I need to watch that movie. I haven't. I haven't. I know. You you all can yell at me in the comments. Go ahead. Um, but look at this. Where have I seen... Oh, God, I need to watch that movie. But where have I seen, like, uh, wall treatments and, and moldings like this? At the Getty Museum here in Los Angeles in the, in the Rococo. 
uh, Baroque and Rococo section of the museum. So that's what Stanley is trying to um, conjure in this, at least in this bathroom. Um, and what really, 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 really caught my eye is the bathtub. That makes me think of room 237 and the bathtub and the crazy lady in the bathtub, right? The naked one. Um, and then this. This is what the the first thing that really, really caught my eye in this photo. The sconce and the um, candles. Yeah. I don't know if this is electric or if these are real candles, but it don't matter because, <laughs> let me go back here. What I tell you about this indirect lighting, and I keep talking about these sconces uh, in The Shining. They're everywhere. Uh, as well as the chandeliers with the, you know, the fake, I guess I can call them electric candles with the light bulbs that are shaped like flames and they're in the chandeliers and they're on the walls with these sconces. And I said, they're there for a reason. I know they are. Well, now I know like where they come from here. Probably also the other one. What is it called? Barry Lyndon, the, that movie with um, Ryan O'Neill. Um... Oof. So he puts this here. Again, I haven't seen 2001. Y'all tell me, are these ever lit in the movie? I will have, I will, I have the box set. I have all of the DVDs of all of the movies Stanley Kubrick made, but I haven't watched them all. Um, tell me. Do, are these light bulbs or are they actual wicks for candles that can be lit and that are meant to like light the room? <sighs> the floor is lit. So that would make these kind of uh, useless. I don't know. So they, that tells us we do have electricity in this room or some source of power that lights whatever, you know, is going on in these uh, lit floors. But what about this? And why is it a candle? Why does it have to be something that evokes the idea, that conjures the idea of a real fire, whether it's a light bulb or not, like, no, oh no, not that, like this here. These are all light bulbs, you know, and it doesn't matter whether or not this is a light bulb, but it's a candle, and the, both, and this one too, candle, They're, they look like candles. Why is he trying to, like I said, I think Stanley Kubrick is trying to, destroy a thought system that has been holding mankind down since more or less day one and he's not going back to like just the 19th century or the 18th century or the baroque or the um the renaissance or uh the medieval gothic or, or the ancient world antiquity ancient rome ancient greece no, he, or not even ancient Egypt or, or you know, the, the Holy Land. Or, no, he's going all the, not even Mesopotamia or any other like ancient culture you can think of. No, he's going all the way, way back to prehistory. He's going back to the caves and the caves, the cave paintings. Oh, this is going to be a long ass video, but I got to tell you about this. The cave paintings were made you know as far as we as far as we know as far as scholars and researchers and people who specialize in that kind of thing are telling us they were made like many many thousands of years ago during the ice age in europe you know there, there's like the, the one of the most famous ones is lascaux in um france and there's also oh god i hope i don't get this wrong but altamira in spain these are cave paintings Okay, made by cave people, Stone Age people, prehistoric people, hunter-gatherer kind of people. They were not living in established kind of settlements. They were nomadic. They would go where the food was, uh, where the hunting was. And then when they would deplete uh, the local sources of animals to hunt and eat and wear and whatever they did with the animal parts, then they would move to a new place. But they left these paintings 
these drawings, images, behind in these caves, which were made with whatever natural materials were available to these people at the time. So in the middle of, like, trying to just survive in this very, very cold, very harsh environment, um, you know, uh, oh, my goodness, they had time to make art, all right, and they made it in caves, and caves, that's why, that's why, Again, according to what the scholars and researchers are telling us, that's why those pe cave paintings survive to this day, because they, w they were made in caves, and these places are protected, and they're shielded from the elements. And sometimes these cave paintings are very deep inside of these caves. Okay, They're not just at the mouth of the cave, or like a short trip from the mouth of the cave uh, going inwards into the cave. No, no. Like some of these places in these caves that have these paintings on the walls are extremely difficult to get to and dangerous to get to. Okay, so these cave people took with them their art supplies, you know, whatever that consisted of, plus a light source. And in pr the prehistoric world, in the Stone Age, you know they didn't have any flashlights. You know they didn't have any like sodium lights like fishermen do. You know they didn't have light bulbs and electricity or anything like that. They had fire. They had fire, they had torches, but they needed something. They needed a source of light so they could see what they were doing. The bulls, that's what it's called, the Hall of the Bulls, I think in, again, is it Lascaux, France? So they couldn't have made those cave paintings in that darkness uh, without some kind of light source so they could see what they were doing. Is that what Stanley is trying to remind us of the light source in the, not, not just ancient, but prehistoric world? And the prehistoric world is the prehistoric world because prehistory is before the invention of writing. That's what separates history from prehistory, the invention of actual written communication. That's why I emphasize so much the Z's in the uh, lobby and its connection to the Hebrew letter Zayin. Okay, it happens to be the seventh letter of the Hebrew alphabet, and it means weapon and or axe. Okay, we're going back to prehistory. Stanley is trying to help humanity. I, that's what I believe. That's why I'm so passionate about this. And I don't think any like artist or filmmaker of the 20th century, at least in the United States, uh, or, you know, from the United States, has done such an amazing job. As Stanley, yeah, there's some good ones. Yeah, there's David Lynch and all these, you know, uh, there's a lot of good directors. But Stanley, Stanley was trying to change the world one person at a time, one viewer at a time, and he's still doing it way past um, his exit from this plane of existence, okay? That's what I believe. And when I saw when I saw Rob post this, I said, "Oh God, oh God, there's so much going on." I know this is a production photo. I know this isn't a scene from the movie, but Stanley's in here. Stanley's here, and Stanley is like, you know, he's still here with us too. He's he's the reason why I make these movies. Uh, movies, nope, not movie. I did it again. Uh, he's the reason why I make these videos. He's the reason why you listen to my videos and other videos on this topic, on his movies, especially The Shining, but all of his other wonderful movies. He's the reason why we're discussing this. We know there's something going on. We know that there is something that he was trying to communicate to his viewers that could not be communicated in words alone or plainly or directly uh, communicated. He had to do it with pictures. And we're here to decipher those pictures. So like, what did it say here? That one of the symptoms of paranoia is uh, assuming there are... <laughs> Cocaine paranoia is assuming there are hidden messages behind music, movies, or advertisements. Oh, good heavens. Y'all, y'all, we need help. We need to go talk to somebody. But that's all I have for you this evening. And I've had a marvelous time talking at you um, and locating the source, in my opinion, of all that freak snow 
um, that 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 freak ass snowstorm that comes out of nowhere in this movie. Yeah, a approximately a month after they've been staying there. Huh. You know, whatever whatever they're experiencing, whatever craziness, whatever hallucinations, whatever paranoia, whatever mental issues and behavior, crazy behavior is going on is a result of, I believe, at this point, cocaine withdrawal and the like psychosis and paranoia and whatever other kind of mental symptoms that go along with it. And why do I believe that? Here. Okay, that's why I believe it. Don't forget. Don't forget. Stanley, in my opinion, in my belief, Stanley Kubrick is just bitch slapping the fuck out of Stephen King <laughs> to this day. It's not over. The slaps keep coming from beyond the grave. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm having way too much fun. But okay, I've I've talked. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's an hour, uh, uh -huh, an hour and 50 minutes. So you all I'll reiterate my church announcements. Uh, returning viewers, thank you for returning. Uh, new viewers, thank you so much for being new. Subscribers, thank you for subscribing. I appreciate every single last one of you. Please don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, and share this long-ass video that I made. Uh, if you know somebody who might be interested in this madness, l tell them. Let them know. Um, and you all... I can't wait to see the comments. I can't wait to see what you have to say. Uh, it, it's okay if you think I'm wrong. I know that. I know I could totally be wrong about everything. But that sure as hell wouldn't stop me from trying. But yeah, I want to hear it, or not hear it, read it in the comments. What do you have to say? What are your contributions? What do you think? I love it all. I love reading all your stuff. And, and knowing that there are other people out there trying to figure this shit out that just it 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 it, it creates happiness for me so until next time you all and like i said i'm working on the part 16 the uh, yeah the colorado lounge video the number 42 video i promise you i'm going to get into full metal jacket soon and continue with kill bill so until next time everybody until i find yet another reason to talk at you i'm f gonna go ahead and bid you bye bye so bye bye everybody <laughs>